Hey guys, and welcome to another educational video. Today I want to focus on capture papers. Uh, in order to do that, I actually want to show you a couple of guns that were vet bringbacks. And I, I would mention that, you know, it was probably about a week or two ago, I actually did a three-part series on unusual bringbacks. Some of you will remember that. Right after that, I got one more uh, vet bringback, which is, again, a little bit unusual. It's a Japanese uh, Type 14 Nambu. Uh, this came back with capture documents. I'm going to show that to you in a little bit and talk about the documents. In fact, we're going to spend some time talking about capture documents and what it means to the price of the gun. But before I talk about this, I want to talk to you about a Black Widow because we just put this on Gun Broker uh, at a $1 auction. I don't know where the price is now, but we listed it uh, starting yesterday. And I want to tell you a little bit about the gun because it comes with a story. This is a uh, BYF-42. Black, known as a Black Widow Luger. Uh, I did a whole video on Black Widow, so if you wonder what that means, just look under uh, Legacy Collectibles and Black Widow. This is a, a beautiful Black Widow that came from the family of the vet. The vet uh, died, I don't know how recently, but his widow was selling off uh, some of his stuff. You'll see here, uh, we actually have his, his whole uniform. That's the jacket, and we have the pants as well. I have it on Gunbroker because the family wanted to do an auction. I, I obviously want to help the family as mo much as I can, and they felt like auctioning was the best option. So we put it on Gunbroker for a dollar. Here's, here's the listing. I can't give you the link, um, but if you go to Gunbroker and search under Black Widow Luger, uh, you will find this and you can feel free to bid. But again, uh, it's the family. Uh, the, the funds will go to the widow of the vet. Let's come a little closer and take a look at this Luger. Um, and in terms of finish, they don't get any better than this. In fact, uh, well, you do see a roll mark here. It was almost too good. One of those ones I talk about, it's too good to be true. Uh, you see the front, front strap and the back strap. I almost did it backwards. The front strap, almost nowhere. You do see a little bit of wear here. Um, the back strap. These grips are as, you can't feel them, but the checkering is very sharp. These are among the nicest grips I've ever seen, so it kind of matches the condition of the gun. Even the uh, hump on the side plate uh, shows very little wear. There is some corrosion, a little bit of corrosion over top of the finish, which is a good sign. Actually, you want to see a little bit of corrosion. And you can see it is a BYF 42, so this is the date, 1942. BYF is the factory code, which is Mauser. Now the proof marks for 1942 should be Eagle 135, and they are. Um, but what makes this even more special is uh, because it came from the vet, we do have the uniform. You can see here on the listings uh, that his jacket, he was a corporal. He was in the 9th Army, uh, 84th Infantry Division, which was the uh, rail splitters. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about his unit. Again, his name was William Hunter, but they say he went by Scotty. And uh, 84th Division, he signed up actually late, uh, late 1943, November of 1943, and he served all the way till November of 45. Now keep in mind that date, November of 45, because I'm going to talk about that later when I talk about bringbacks. His unit, I, I don't have a connection with him for all of these battles, but uh, the history of his unit... Uh, the 84th Infantry uh, was at Normandy, uh, so they did participate in D-Day. Uh, they were involved in the march across France. They actually entered uh, Germany through the Ruhr Valley, which is right above Aachen. If you remember, I did another video about a, a capture gun that came from the Battle of Aachen. Actually, that was the nickel, the nickel PPK. Um, that, that was one of my favorites. So he participated in those battles, also the march across uh, Belgium and into Germany. I mentioned already that he went into Germany. He participated in the Battle of the Bulge, or I should say his unit. Again, I'm not going from stories told uh, to his family by him because he really didn't talk about the war, but we know his unit was involved in the Battle of the Bulge and then re recovered the territory that had already been taken. And then his unit was involved in the liberation of two sub-camps of uh, Buchenwald. Now, we've already done enough about the death camps, but again, imagine uh, walking into one of those death camps having no idea what you're about to walk into. So uh, William Hunter, in my opinion, was a true American hero, and uh, his family is uh, moving along some of his treasures, including his uniform and this uh, Black Widow Luger. Again, uh, just a beautiful gun. Uh, so check that out on Gunbroker if that's uh, of interest to you. 
And now let's move on to the Nambu. So as I previously mentioned, and the reason I, I really wanted to talk about capture documents is because this is a very rare um, Nambu. Not that the, the Nambu is rare, it's the fact that it comes with captured documents. Out of probably a hundred captured documents that we have gotten and sold uh, through Legacy, probably we've only had four that had captured documents. So that's, uh, you know, a 4% uh, um, in terms of capture documents coming from the Pacific Theater. I have a couple to show you. Um, let's take a clo closer look at this one. Uh, this is the gun. Uh, we'll take a look at the serial number. You can see it ends in 771, and you can see how they typed it up. Now, some, sometimes they're handwritten, and sometimes they're typed. In, in all cases, you want to make sure that the name typed and the what uh, the bring back item typed is the same font. In other words, it has to be the same typewriter. I have seen it where they just have a name in it and then they retype this. Maybe they white it out and make a copy of it. Uh, you, basically, I, I want to say watch out for false capture papers because capture papers, it used to add about 10 to 15 percent but there are collectors who really go after capture documents, guns, guns with capture documents. And because of that, they get them, they hoard them, they never let them go, so they get gobbled up quickly. I know whenever we have a gun like this with a capture document, it doesn't last very long, and the people who get them don't want to sell them. They hold on to them. They actually treasure these. So now the prices have gone to, it's almost a 20%, 25% markup, with capture documents. So because the prices are going up and just adding this piece of paper really helps it, you have to watch out for uh, faked documents. Uh, these I'm sure are correct just because, again, it shouldn't look like a computer printout or an IBM typewriter. This is an early typewriter. You can tell by uh, the markings that's an original signature. Uh, the, the typewriter here matches the typewriter here, matches the typewriter here, so you want to look for those kinds of things. Uh, and I said sometimes they're handwritten. So these have a little bit of both. They are handwritten and they're typed. And here, you can barely tell what it says. It's clearer over here because um, I showed you a captured document on the last one and they said there were three copies. One went to the unit records and I think two went to the individual. Uh, but he has two of these, and here it clearly is handwritten, says sold to, and sold to. So he was obviously in the Pacific Theater, but maybe went back to base camp, or maybe went back um, on R&R &R and picked up a souvenir. I can only imagine that uh, Roland was involved in one of the islands, uh, you know, maybe... Iwo Jima or Okinawa, he gets done the battle and he goes back and says, crap, I wish I had picked up one of those guns. Um, the, basically, people traded them. We've talked about this before. We, we tend to get a glamorous image of, you know, a soldier who captures an officer and puts a gun to his head and says, give me your gun and give me your sword. And they hand it over. And that's how these things were, um, th that's how these things were captured. When in fact, I'm going to show you evidence uh, to the contrary, that often these just were available at the PX or the local quartermaster or people just trading back at the base camp um, as opposed to anything heroic or romantic. So this one uh, does have two, uh, two documents and you can see how flimsy they are. Uh, likely people just folded them up and maybe stuck them in their wallet. You, this would, you know, the way the edges are, this is often the case. They often are folded. Uh, sometimes they're put down inside a holster. Uh, this, by the way, did come with a holster, so I should show you that. So they just put it in with the holster. That's probably what I would do. That's the only way they could stay together, because otherwise uh, you would lose them over time. Uh, the example I want to share is I just got my COVID card. It's in my, I carry it in my wallet. It's all folded up. Someday it'll look like this. But I can promise you 80 years from now, I'm not going to have my COVID card because nobody's going to care. <laughs> we will have moved on to some other crisis. I will have thrown it away. You needed this document, uh, not so much in the Pacific Theater, but I'm convinced in the European th Theater, you needed uh, this document to show that you legally picked this up and you're bringing it at home as a war souvenir. And so you would want to hold on to this until you got home, safe and sound uh, with your family, and then nobody cares anymore. Nobody's knocking on your door saying where you got that gun. In fact, more than 80 years later, uh, people bring these to gun shows all the time. Absolutely no documents. And they sell them to dealers like me. We don't have any requirement 
to find out where this came from and how it came into the country. We just need to log it in to our ATF records, put it on record, and then when we sell it, we legally transfer it to the next party. Now, the gun and the holster. You can see, uh, there's, here's a picture here of a leather holster. The earlier ones were leather and more what we're used to. These are called a clamshell because the, uh, well, the shell uh, just looks like a clamshell. They fold down. This rubberized uh, canvas, um, it's, it is layers of canvas and rubberized to keep it uh, water, waterproof. Uh, they become very stiff over time so that it's so often it's very hard. You, you pull this open and it's very hard to open this. This one is actually as pliable as I've seen. But if you look at the capture document, the way it's folded, it easily fits in this compartment. Um, I'm not going to do it because, well, maybe I will do it. There it is folded up and it clearly fits down inside there. So that makes perfect sense that that's how this stayed together. But again, the Pacific Theater, you, you know, only 4% of the captured papers I see are from the Pacific Theater. So in my opinion, this is just my conjecture, uh, the U.S. Marine Corps and going island to island and the fact that nobody wants to take this home as a protection piece, um, basically they were picked up as souvenirs and never used. Um, I really don't think as opposed to the German pistols, not too many people pick this up saying, you know, I really need a home protection piece. I'd like a good Japanese Nambu. I don't think that happened just because they're fraught with problems. Um, I'll talk a little bit about that next. But uh, finishing up with this holster, you do see the kanji writing in here. Uh, they almost always will have that unless it's worn away. Um, and again, this is uh, mid-war, and then they also made them into the late war period. Uh, you can see here that uh, some of the leather is worn away. That's pretty typical. And these um, straps in the back, you can, you can see when I talked about how tight it gets, I can't open that at all. You could not get a belt in there. So that's a better example how this rubberized uh, canvas just become, becomes almost rock hard. And if it's stored with something on top of it, I've had them where I can't get a gun in it anymore because the... the um, rubberized canvas has just uh, gotten like solid like a rock. This, this one, there's a little piece of wood down inside there. Uh, this one fits uh, very nicely, snugly. And if I had a spare magazine, there's a holder for the cleaning rod right here. And, and then you can slide a spare magazine and when you put this inside of it, it covers up the spare magazine. I might as well show you. Um, so surprisingly, uh, because of the design, I, I wouldn't, you know, I, I just never assume that these things work real well, but surprisingly, this slides right in. You can actually see a little circle right there, which corresponds with that little circle. So you know that the spare magazine fit right in there, and it's very snug. It doesn't, if I hold this, it really doesn't rattle around at all. It's in there very snugly and actually doesn't even fall out. And then the gun itself, um, I happen to not have a magazine in it, but even with a magazine in it, the gun itself fits nicely and it closes up very easily. Um, there's also a spot for a spare firing pin right here. And uh, this is actually for a box of ammo, but in this case, it probably held a capture paper. Uh, the, spare, uh, the spare firing pin, I've mentioned that before. In the past, I've talked about problems with these guns. This, in fact, is a transitional model because the earliest ones had the small trigger guard and they had straw parts, and this is a different cocking knob than later. Uh, this cocking knob, uh, well, they actually went from that design to this design. Not sure what the advantage would be, but you do see what makes it transitional. It does have the larger uh, uh, trigger guard, and that was for winter gloves. Uh, you, you're finger would fit in there a lot more easily, uh, but it still has the straw part and the early cocking knob. Um, and checking the firing pin, I always encourage people to check the firing pin. You should also check the inside of the grip, by the way, the grips would break. Uh, in this case, the mag retention spring is broken. You can see right here, this is broken. Um, often the grips are broken. These are numbered to the gun in pencil. The early ones, they're stamped, but in this one, they're just marked in pencil, and you know, so that would be easy for somebody to change. All you have to do to check the firing pin is first you want to um, pull the bolt back, push this button in, and this unscrews. It'll come off. I'm not gonna go through all that because there's a spring in there, 
and then you do, this is the firing pin here. You can pull that out and you can check it. Uh, sometimes the end of the firing pin is broken. I just happen to have an example of a firing pin. Uh, did not come with this. I think this one's blank. Yeah, this one is blank, although it does have a proof mark, I believe. There's some kind of a proof mark right there. Um, but often this is broken, and that's why they have the spare one. And then it, they usually will be numbered to the gun, unless it's a replacement. And so no number is better than a, um, the wrong number, but uh, that fits right inside there. So you want to check that because they often break, and that leads to the moral of my story. These often break and are not very reliable, um, and I certainly wouldn't recommend it as a protection piece. I do recommend it as a wartime souvenir, however. Uh, this one also is missing the extractor right here. You can see what it should look like. There's the extractor, there's the missing extractor, and original parts are not that hard to find. Um, uh, probably eBay or Gunbroker, you can find the parts. You know, I don't think I ever gave you the date on this. Um, you wanna add 25 because that was the year of the emperor. The first year of the emperor was uh, 25, 1925. So add 25 to that and you get uh, May of 1941. And you can see, uh, again, uh, island hopping. The Japanese are uh, island nation, and so they're uh, on board ships. You can see a lot of the corrosion, and that's the typical what I call salt air corrosion. I see that on Navy Lugers as well. Uh, this is uh, probably worse than most, whereas this one is made right at the end of the war. Um, this tag means it's already on our website, uh, but this is uh, from 1944. Uh, actually, it's really late. So 8 is August of 1944. Uh, oh, I was going to say near the end of the war, but that would be August of 45. So this is August of 44, um, and this, this finish is a lot nicer um, and probably um, a little bit better condition than, than this one, although the transitional ones uh, do command a little bit of a premium. So two good really examples, but again, what makes it really rare is the Pacific Theater capture paper. I have an additional uh, Pacific Theater capture paper. Uh, this goes to a, he says Jap rifle. We're not supposed to say that, so that's politically incorrect. Uh, but here it says Jap rifle and one bayonet that went with it. You can see the private that brought it home. Uh, he was on Okinawa. Um, and this was stamped. Uh, I want to show you that this was an official document. These became official documents, and this is the style, again, of the Pacific Theater. We're going to show you Euro European theater uh, soon, but it just says certificate at the top. Now, this one, it talks about uh, legally, legally captured, uh, uh, pursuant to uh, provisions of Section 3, War Department. It gives, it documents the order that allows the vet to bring it home. And I say that because every time I do a capture document, somebody uh, very rudely says, you mean stolen. These are not stolen weapons. They were legally acquired as souvenirs during war. I will say more about that in a minute, but just notice the style of the Pacific Theater. I, I know I should probably take this out of the plastic, but this one's falling apart, so I'm just gonna leave it like it is. And if you have an Ancestry um, account, you can actually go in. In this case, I'm covering up because there's personal information about Robert, uh, including his Social Security number. So I don't want to give that out because somebody in the next election will be using his ID to vote. Um, but it gives uh, personal information about Robert. You can see a little bit about where he was born and a little bit about his life. So if you have an account, sometimes you can find information, but often I can't really find anything. Now let's take a look at the European theater because I've already mentioned there's 10 times as many capture papers for the European theater than there is for the Pacific theater. And this first line that I have are all non-typical uh, capture papers. I just want to take a quick review. It just says certificate. But one thing they all have in, in common, they all say this is a war souvenir. They quote the section in the law that allows this to happen, again, perfectly legal. And they have the paperwork uh, done. So this is not, uh, not typical. You see the dates are after the war. Uh, for almost all of these, we're going to see the date is after the war. Here's a non-typical one, included some clothing. So so he brought home a uniform. He brought it home in his duffel bag. So uh, we see that. Also, this is from the Medical Corps. So that's kind of interesting. 
Uh, here's another certificate I've seen more than once, uh, but it has the same, same style. Here's one that looks uh, very different, and here's why. Uh, this went to Manitoba. So this was a capture paper uh, from the Canadian Army uh, or Canadian Armed Forces. Uh, but I wanted you to see that one. So Canadians had the same system where they uh, required capture papers. Uh, some people, again, I'm, I'm assuming some people violated it, uh, but uh, in this case, that's a Canadian capture paper. And then this one I wanted to show you is a little bit different because he has a carry card, uh, something he carried in his wallet saying he had permission. It has the serial number of a PPK and also information here, but this is well after the war. This is uh, 1949, so even all the way to 1949. They changed the paperwork a little bit, made it probably a little bit more regulated, and then you carried a permit card to have this uh, pistol in your possession. But by far, this is the vast majority. Now, I've probably sold at least 40 of the capture papers like this. You can see the stamp on here that is European theater. Uh, this is a copy. These are copies. Uh, the originals, in terms of, of value of the gun, the value of the capture paper, obviously originals are better, uh, but often they made copies because there's multiple weapons, multiple items. So obviously you can't have an original for every item. And so for these, uh, there are copies, and it does, uh, for some collectors, it's a little bit of a turnoff, but these are original copy papers. Um, you will notice every single one of these is post-war. Uh, there's only one exception, and it's this one right here. It is a lieutenant, uh, and maybe he mailed it home. I doubt that he left. Well, he could have left if he was wounded. He could have been sent home, much like Birch. Uh, we talked about him being uh, severely wounded and being sent home a little bit early. Uh, but this is the only capture paper I've seen um, in my memory that had a... Uh, a date that was during the war. Everything else is post-war. So when you see those guys lined up uh, at the tent, at the booty tent, so to speak, to get the documents signed, it's basically the war is over, they're picking up their souvenirs, and they're uh, taking them home with them in their duffel bags, uh, or in some cases, probably mailing things home. I already talked about the Pacific Theater documents. These are the Pacific Theater document. I wanted to show you one more. It's a little bit hard to read. But uh, these are also very rare. This is a capture paper from Vietnam, the Vietnam War, uh, U.S. Marine Corps. It is actually uh, permission to bring home a uh, Type 56. And I think that this would be very difficult to do because in many cases these were full auto weapons. And again, I, I think uh, the U.S. Army, the U.S. military really frowned on bringing home uh, war souvenirs during Vietnam. Most of this stuff came back at the end of the war, after the war was over. So here's my theory, and this, um, this is mostly conjecture on my part, but I think there's a lot of evidence. In fact, there's photographs to show this. Um, first of all, there was tons of stuff at the end of the war. We've shown these pictures before, but if you look around, people, you know, the people say, oh, you stole these guns. This isn't a kind of thing where people, again, they're not walking up to a guy and saying, raise your hands, give me your gun. They stick it in their pocket and they carry it for them. They carry it with them in their backpack for the next year and a half. Can you imagine picking up two or three Lugers in 1944? You're at, you're at Normandy. And I've, I've heard the story that this was captured at Normandy. So that means the guy put it in his backpack. He sludged through the mud, the rain, the snow, he, uh, all the way to the end of the war. And at the end of the war, he goes to his commanding officer and say, hey, can I have your permission to take this? I don't think it happened that way. Now, sometimes it did. Um, but often when somebody says, I got this at Normandy, probably they were at Normandy and they picked it up sometime later. Now, I'm not saying that people are lying. I'm thinking that the most common example is you needed to get permission to bring the guns home. And it says right on there, according to Article so-and-so, Section 3, Section 4, according to our martial law, you have our permission to take home a souvenir. And I have heard of units that said you were allowed two souvenirs. And some people say, take whatever you want. But look at the piles of leftover guns. And what was happening to these guns? I've talked to uh, several combat engineers who have said, we got bulldozers. We pushed them all in a bulldozer and we either burned them or covered them up. Um, a lot of them, people said, I didn't want to stand in line. By the way, here's the booty tent. Uh, this is literally the booty tent. And I want to say uh, to Derek, thank you so much. Uh, he sent me a lot of these pictures, but 
the guys would line up. They would have their captured souvenirs. You can see them standing in line. They go into the tent, and the commanding officer is there all day just signing these documents saying, you have permission to take home your war souvenir. That's more than likely how this happened, and here's the pictures to prove it. Now, they didn't have time to do this in the middle of battle. You guys know that. They were moving. In fact, the people who came through the Walder factory, the guy who wrote down that I was in the Walder factory, my unit went into the Walder factory, we were allowed to get two, only take two. I took four and went back to my buddy who didn't get an opportunity to go to the factory, and I gave him two. And they, they had permission from their commanding officer to bring back two war souvenirs, and that's how that happened. They were always on the move. Oh, the point I was going to make, the guy said, we were at the factory for about a day, and then they made us move on. They had to move on and fight. It's day after day. They're moving. They don't want to carry a lot of this stuff with them. Uh, but sometimes, of course, they did. At the end, they want to then get permission. Now, when were they coming home? If you watch Band of Brothers, in fact, they're all standing around. The war's over. I think there's one scene where uh, Captain Winters is going uh, swimming, and they're all standing around wondering when they get to, get to go home. They were worried about, am I going to be sent to Japan, or I'm going to get to go home? If you remember when we talked about Birch, who uh, died of his wounds, he, got, he was one of the first to go home because he got po points for being wounded. So he was evacuated more quickly. Um, but many of these guys were standing around with nothing to do. I talked to vets who said we would, we would uh, play poker, we would play baseball. Uh, we, had, you know, we were bored and they had a few light duties, but they then would go uh, pick up souvenirs, which again are everywhere in Germany. They're all going to be destroyed, so why not take some things home? All, my point is that people wanted souvenirs. It wasn't stealing. Um, all of this stuff was going to be destroyed anyway. And I forgot this part. A lot of the guys who didn't have permission, uh, this stuff was gathered up and thrown into the ocean. There's testimony from soldiers who said, yeah, they caught me. Uh, I, I threw a couple of guns in my duffel bag. I got caught. All of that stuff got dumped into the ocean. So there's a huge supply of weapons on the docks off the coast of France. Uh, and there's buried piles of, of weapons all over Germany. Not all of them came to the United States. Some of them went to Britain. And unfor unfortunately for the Brits, they were not allowed to keep them. I don't know when they passed the laws that they couldn't keep them. A lot of those came to the United States. Then the Russians. What happened to all the Russian capture weapons? They say the GIs brought home over a million weapons. I'm sure the Russians caught, captured just as many, if not more. They tended to gather them all up and put them in warehouses strategically throughout the Eastern Bloc. They were kept in uh, warehouses in a lot of the satellite nations, but also in, in Russia itself. After the fall of the Iron Curtain, those warehouses were opened up, and that's where you hear about all these Russian-dipped guns. Uh, Lugers, uh, a lot of P-38s, other handguns. I, I'm, I'm sure that K-98s as well. They were all stored in warehouses. But af again, after the fall of the Iron Curtain, then U.S. <laughs> importers went over there. They were buying them from Romania, Bulgaria, Czechoslovakia, East Germany, uh, Poland. All of these warehouses were emptied out. And guess where they all ended up? Back in the United States. Hey, I hope you learned something today. I, I had a uh, great time going through some of my piles of uh, capture papers. Um, and just seeing the, the, all the different styles and the types. Uh, there's a lot of research that can be done on the guys that brought some of this stuff home. Uh, make sure you like and subscribe to our channel because I have more guns to show you real soon.